Since this YouTube video can be watched from anywhere in the world, I'm not sure it's fair to expect you to know much about this man, Oscar Wilde. A poet, playwright and novelist, he was born in Dublin in 1854. His wealthy father was Sir William Wilde, an Irish eye and ear surgeon, and an author of significant works on medicine, archaeology and folklore. While his mother, Lady Jane Wilde, shown here, who had distant Italian ancestry, wrote poetry under the pseudonym Speranza. Not surprisingly, she inculcated a love of poetry in her children from an early age. Oscar was exceedingly intelligent, learning fluent French and German at home as a child and becoming an outstanding classic scholar at Trinity College Dublin, shown here, and later at Magdalen College Oxford, shown here. During his time in Oxford, Wilde developed an interest in Catholicism and even spoke with clergymen about converting to the Catholic faith. When his father found out about this, he threatened to cut off his financial support if Wilde became Catholic. Oscar retained his interest in the church, even though he did not convert. Being an advocate of aestheticism, he was keen to emphasise beauty and the cultivation of the arts. He became leader of the aesthetic and decadent movement that swept England in the late 19th century promoting, as it did, the appreciation and production of art for its own sake and no other cause, not financial, not religious or otherwise. At one point he asserted, one should either be a work of art or wear a work of art. He wore long hair, he scorned manly sports, and at college he decorated his rooms with peacock feathers, lilies, sunflowers, blue china and art objects. A flamboyant character, today we might describe him as camp, a modern word I don't much like, meaning effeminate or self-consciously flamboyant. Through living his life in the public eye and being witty, cynical and controversial, Oscar inspired numerous biographies about his achievements and his ultimate downfall. He published some poetry at a young age, and after university went on a year-long tour of North America, giving lectures on aestheticism, interior design, and the latest Gilbert and Sullivan operator to be touring the United States, entitled Patience. Like in caricatures, the press claimed that his only distinction was having written, and I quote, a thin volume of very mediocre verse. Being a man in high society, the English magazine Punch enjoyed to joke at his expense. Some argue that Oscar Wilde's genius for self-promotion arguably made him the inventor and ultimately the victim of celebrity culture, and he kept himself in the limelight with entertaining and controversial epithets such as Always forgive your enemies, nothing annoys them so much, and Women are meant to be loved, not to be understood. In May 1884, whether it was love or not, Oscar married a handsome woman, Constance Lloyd, the daughter of a wealthy barrister. They moved into a home in Tite Street in fashionable Chelsea, a house which now carries a blue plaque for the benefit of the curious. And soon they had two sons. But this marriage unravelled, not least because he met a precocious 17-year-old boy named Robert Ross. This rare photograph shows Ross at the age of 13, and this one shows him as an adult. Despite strict Victorian taboos about homosexuality, Ross was determined to seduce Wilde and is reputed to have initiated him into homosexual sex, a criminal offence in Britain at the time. Despite all that happened later in Oscar Wilde's life, Robbie Ross remained nonetheless a true and supportive friend. Career-wise, Wilde became the editor of the Woman's World magazine. But his enthusiasm faded owing to the administrative demands and his tedious office life. So he went freelance instead, writing magazine stories and longer pieces on his aesthetic ideas. One biographer described his essays as exuding wit, genius and character. And then, in 1891, he published his first and only novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray.
In this, the main character, Gray, makes a Faustian pact for his painted portrait to age while he himself remains beautiful and young forever. Faust, you'll recall, was a German astronomer reputed to have sold his soul to the devil. As time passed, Gray was horrified to watch his portrait become shamefully distorted, reflecting his own decadence. Reviewers criticised the novel for its homosexual allusions, and one critic described it as heavy with the stinking odours of moral and spiritual putrefaction. He subsequently revised it by adding six new chapters and removing some of the homoerotic episodes. Surprise, surprise, he became even more a celebrity in London society. His greatest success lay in a series of plays, his comedies of society. Witty on the surface, they often contained biting social comment. Titles such as Lady Windermere's Fan, A Woman of No Importance, An Ideal Husband, and his most popular play, The Importance of Being Earnest, which is still shown in theatres today. One critic credited these productions with being well-pitched and targeted at his audience with adroit precision. 1891 was also the year that Oscar met a handsome, overindulged young man called Lord Alfred Douglas, seen here, and called by Wilde by the name Bosey. He was the son of John Douglas, the ninth Marquess of Queensbury, the man behind the Queensbury rules of boxing. Wilde became infatuated with Bosey, which led to a tempestuous affair. If Wilde was indiscreet, Alfred Douglas was reckless too, dragging Wilde into the underground world of gay prostitution, where Oscar consorted with young working-class boys for nefarious purposes. Subsequently, in his work De Profundis, he described this period of his life. It was like feasting with panthers, he wrote. The danger was half the excitement. It's not really surprising that he ended up in court on a gross indecency charge. It began with an accusation against him of sodomy made by Douglas's father. In response, Wilde pursued a private libel case against the Marquis, but the tables were turned and Wilde himself was put on a criminal charge. After a sensational trial, Oscar received a prison sentence of two years hard labour, and therein lay the catastrophe of his life. He lost his wealth, he lost his family, and he lost most of his friends. And as far as respectable society was concerned, he became a social leper. He was imprisoned from 1895 to 1897 with a regimen of hard labour, hard fare and hard bed, and his health suffered accordingly. This is a modern photograph of the cell in Reading Jail, where he was incarcerated. While still there, he wrote a letter of 50,000 words to Alfred Douglas. It was also published under the title De Profundis, being a heartfelt cry on Wilde's part of deep sorrow and anguish. With his final release and being a social pariah in English society, Wilde sailed instead and immediately for Dieppe to live in France for the remaining three years of his sad life. During the part of his prison sentence served in Reading, an execution by hanging took place there for the first time in 18 years. It was the experience that inspired him to write a long poem, The Ballad of Reading Jail, which subsequently became a bestseller. But he went down rapidly in France, developing a drink problem, and before long he was confined in his hotel room. My wallpaper and I are fighting a duel to the death, he declared. One of us has to go. And he was the one to go when he developed meningitis. He died a pauper on the 30th of November 1900. Yet an extravagant tomb was erected in France, shown here, to commemorate his life. But was he really dead? Or had he simply moved on to another plane of existence? Let's move on a couple of decades to an Irish medium called Hester Dowden. This is a photograph of her. She was also known by her married name, Hester Travers Smith, but she divorced in 1916 and moved from Dublin to London, where she wrote two books, 
Voices from the Void in 1919, and then in 1924 she published Psychic Messages from Oscar Wilde. She received these messages through automatic writing and through the Ouija board. Now, at the College of Science in Dublin, seen here, Sir William Barrett was Professor of Experimental Physics, an eminent man elected a Fellow of the Royal Society and the Royal Society of Edinburgh and the Royal Dublin Society. He was also knighted for his achievements in 1912. He was a keen psychical researcher and one of the founders of the Society for Psychical Research in London. Hester Dowden was a good personal friend of his, and in a sense, he was her mentor. So it's not surprising that she dedicated to him her book on Oscar Wilde's afterlife communications, and he writes in it for her. Hester had several spirit guides on the other side, including Johannes, who claimed to be a Jew from 200 BC, of whom more later. Acting as gatekeeper, these guides prevent interference from unwanted spirits during seances. Geraldine Cummins was also a friend of hers, an Irish woman whom she introduced to mediumship. Miss Cummins became famous in her own right, known especially for her spirit communications with the dead psychical researcher Frederick Myers. She channeled two of his books, which were very well received, The Road to Immortality, and beyond human personality. You might ask why I'm interested in the wild scripts. Well, firstly, I enjoyed reading them. And secondly, I learned that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle had described them as, and I quote, the best evidence for the survival of personality that I know of. Since Conan Doyle was very familiar with the evidence for survival after death, not least in his two-volume study, The History of Spiritualism, it seems reasonable to check out why he thinks this evidence is the best. So what were Wilde's posthumous communications like? Well, here's an example, and it's quite florid. In eternal twilight I move, but I know that in the world there's day and night, seed time and harvest, and red sunset must follow apple green dawn. Every year spring throws her green veil over the world. The red autumn glory comes to mock the yellow moon. Already the May is creeping like a white mist over land and hedgerow, and year after year the hawthorn bears blood-red fruit after the death of its May. This lyrical description is typical of Oscar Wilde, using, for example, the adjective apple green to describe the dawn, and also picturing the flowers of the maybush creeping like a white mist. It's very much his style. But before continuing, I should mention how these scripts were collected, since they involved not only Hester Dowden, but also Geraldine Cummins as a transcriber, and a Mr V who was being trained by Dowden in automatic writing. They discovered that if he alone held the pencil for automatic writing, it did nothing but stutter up and down, creating nothing. But if Hester Dowden touched his other hand with her own hand, the writing flowed at an incredible speed. The lyrical piece I've just read was produced by Mr V's hand under Hester Dowden's influence. The other method was by using the Ouija board. For this, the letters of the alphabet were spread on top of a table and kept under a sheet of glass. With Dowden touching a small pointer designed to move easily, it would whiz around the glass tabletop incredibly quickly, with Miss Cummins recording each letter as the process proceeded. On two occasions, these movements were so fast she could hardly keep up with the note-taking. Now, I've analysed the sessions in this book, which took place over 48 days, from the 8th of June 1923 to the 26th of July. Automatic writing was used in six sessions, with Mr V holding the pencil and Hester Dowden touching his hand. The Ouija board was used in ten sessions, with Hester in control of the pointer and Miss Cummins recording the moves. One other Ouija session took place with the anonymous Miss D as the recorder.
So a total of 17 sessions in all, and on three occasions, two sessions were held on the same day. Turning to the messages themselves, Wilde, if it was he, was asked by Mrs Dowden why he came to these sessions, and he replied to let the world know that Oscar Wilde is not dead. His thoughts live on in the hearts of those who, in a gross age, can hear the flute voice of beauty calling on the hills, or mark where her white feet brush the dew from the cowslips in the morning. Now the mere memory of the beauty of the world is an exquisite pain. I was always one of those for whom the visible world existed. I worshipped at the shrine of things seen. There was not a blood stripe on a tulip, or a curve on a shell, or a tone on the sea, but had for me its meaning and its mystery, and its appeal to the imagination. One might sip the pale lees of the cup of thought, but for me the red wine of life. As Simon Park observed in his book Conversations with Arthur Conan Doyle, it's hard to see Mr V and Hester Dowden coming up with these lines themselves, unless a lyrical scriptwriter was hiding under the table. While neither of these pieces I've read to you are humorous, he was still capable of humour, as in this case. Being dead, he said, is the most boring experience in life. That is, if one accepts being married or dining with a schoolmaster. There are several occasions in Dowden's book where she focuses on Wilde's views regarding other literary figures, and he's relentlessly cutting about virtually all of them. Indeed, the spirit guide Johannes did not approve of Oscar Wilde. He is unpleasant, said Johannes. You may speak to him, but not often or much. Maybe this explains why the sessions were soon cut off. So what did Wilde think of James Joyce's novel Ulysses? His reply was, It is a singular matter that a countryman of mine should have produced this great bulk of filth. You may smile at me for uttering this when you reflect that in the eyes of the world I am a tainted creature. But at least I had a sense of the value of things on the terrestrial globe. Here, in Ulysses, I find a monster who cannot constrain the monstrosities of his own brain. Shame on Joyce. Shame on the work. Shame on his lying soul. When consulted about Thomas Hardy's novel, Tess, Wilde replies, A very harmless writer, Hardy. I well remember how his Tess set hearts a-throbbing. It was a tale which might attract the schoolgirl who imagined she had just arrived at puberty. But as a work, this book is shapeless and has neither value as an artificial rendering of rustic life, nor as a minute study of the village. In response to the question, what do you think of the Sitwells? Have you read their poetry? He says, no. I do not spend my precious hours in catching tadpoles. I only leap into the minds of those who have a certain value. Below this standard, I do not sink. Do you know Goldsworthy's play entitled Justice? Hester inquired. Yes, I know it well, was the reply. I have carefully digested what our friend has said about a subject he knows nothing of. And this, despite Goldsworthy being a qualified barrister. The tenor of Wilde's offerings is consistently pessimistic. He talks of wallowing in the twilight in the afterlife, which suggests that he's in a lower sphere below what is known as the wonderful summerland. And he remarks that he's been given unsatisfactory work to accomplish. Yet he retains an optimism that things will improve in due course. In the foreword to her book, Hester Dowden writes, I leave it to my readers to pronounce on the case. I speak with assurance of Oscar Wilde's continued existence merely for convenience. My own feeling is that of a diver who has pulled up a strange creature from the deep and wonders what nature he may be. In trying to get to grips with what it all means for the survival of spirit or the powers of the subconscious, Dowden actually devotes 77 pages to discussing how Wilde's statements should be interpreted. It's an involved discussion, 
and if you're interested enough, you can obtain the book for yourself. In the preface to it, Sir William Barrett says... Personally, I am convinced that whilst many supernormal psychical phenomena may ultimately be proved to be due to abnormal conditions of the brain, yet there will be found to remain well-attested facts which will compel science to admit the existence of a soul, and also a spiritual world peopled with discarnate intelligent beings, some of whom can occasionally, but more or less imperfectly, get into communication with us. Given the entire honesty and trustworthiness of the automatists themselves, and of this there is no reason to doubt, they do afford strong evidence of survival after the dissolution of the body and brain. And Geraldine Cummins seems to agree with this when she warns style, handwriting, personality, the speed of communication and the facts unknown to the mediums must all be carefully considered before any judgment can be passed. Arthur Conan Doyle comes to the following conclusion. I do not think that any person who approaches this problem with an open mind can doubt that the case for wild survival and communication is overpoweringly strong. My final comment on this story concerns the participant known as Mr V. Otherwise known as Dr Samuel Soul, he was a mathematician reported to have no particular interest in Oscar Wilde. Later he decided that the Wilde scripts were largely the product of cryptomnesia, which is to say he suggests that the phenomena such as these scripts were really just forgotten memories, incorrectly retrieved as something new and original by the medium or participants. But be aware that Soul was involved in recording only six of the 17 Oscar Wilde scripts. Much later, from 1936 to 1941, when he was investigating ESP using card tests, like those developed at Duke University in the United States, he performed over 120,000 trials of card guessing using 160 participants, but without ever being able to report a significant finding. So he concluded, rather scathingly, that telepathy was a purely American phenomenon, a point of view that the famous researcher J.B. Ryan described as coming from one of his most harsh and unfair critics. In contrast, during the 1940s and 50s, Dr. Soule reported a high success rate in telepathy experiments. But following his death, computer analysis of his results suggested that he had actually systematically faked his results. According to the investigator, Donald West, this amounted to the single most serious case of fraud in the field of parapsychology. So the question arises, does Soul's later reputation as a cheat affect the veracity of the earlier Oscar Wilde sittings? Well, you have to make up your own mind about that. Personally, I think not. Thanks for listening.